of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That's terrific. Thank you both for uh, reading the Bible. Please do keep your Bibles open at Acts chapter 23. You might also want to have, there's a little outline uh, that you might want to have beside you. You can scribble some notes. It might just help you to focus and concentrate. Uh, certainly take it home. It will trigger some memories and, and the Word will continue to be at work. Let's uh, pray with our Bibles open uh, that God would speak to us, that we would listen, and that God would transform us as we see more about Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice in your gospel. We thank you so much for the written word of the Lord, and we would pray that you would help us to be attentive today, help us to love what we hear, and we pray that we would leave this place encouraged and that we would not fear the threats that are all around us. And we pray that for the glory of Christ. Amen. Amen. What do you think are the biggest threats to the spread and to the growth of Christianity in this country? I don't know what would be on your top list. If you had a danger list of the threats to the spread of the news about Jesus Christ, the spread of the word of God in this country, what would be on your list? Well, let me share the item that is on the top of my list. It is called intolerant tolerance. I'm going to explain what that means, but what is it? Intolerant tolerance. Uh, Now, Christianity at its best offers tolerance, the tolerance that our society needs. Now, that has been misused in the past, and Christians uh, or those who have used Christianity have done atrocious things in the name of Christ. But Christianity at its best offers us the tolerance that we need in our society. Uh, what do I mean by that in Christianity? There is a commitment to the truth. And there is a determination to not speak about what is true, but to reveal what is false. So we speak about what is true and what is false. In Christianity, it is not all about preference. Uh, Christians believe there is such a thing as right and such a thing as wrong. However, alongside those convictions, there is also a tolerance, uh, an acceptance that other people will hold alternative views. And that is good. That is healthy tolerance. Healthy tolerance says, we believe this is right. We believe you are wrong. We will tell you you are wrong. We will not physically assault you, but we will argue our case. And you know something? You can argue your case as well and tell us that we are wrong. But that is healthy tolerance, to believe in right and wrong and to be involved in a conversation with other people. It enables a whole variety of people to live in the same place, to hold their personal convictions, and for other people to disagree with them. Now, you may have noticed that an alternative tolerance is now much more popular in this country, particularly in Western societies. It's what many people call intolerant tolerance. Now, the people themselves never call it that, but that's what many people do call it. And you often hear it expressed in the areas of sexuality, of gender, and religious belief. And it goes something like this. And I'm sure as I describe it, uh, you will be aware of it, and you might even be living through it right now, whether you are young or old. It goes something like this. All of these things, whether it's sexuality, whether it's gender or religious belief, are all in the realm of preference. And intolerant tolerance says, you must believe this. Uh, You cannot believe uh, that what you hold is true or false. You must believe that it is your preference and that is all it is. You cannot say to somebody, you are wrong. You can only say what you believe is different. Now, that is not like the old tolerance. The old tolerance, you could hold your belief, you could tell someone you were wrong, and you could have a conversation with them. But that is changing. Uh, In our culture today, there is a commitment to personal preference as the fundamental truth and an elimination of people from areas of society who think differently. So if you do not sign up to preference above all things, then you will be excluded from different areas of society. 
your voice will be silenced. Now, that is what I call intolerant tolerance. It presents itself as cuddly inclusion. And often it presents itself with all sorts of multicolored because it seems also cute and also inclusive. But it is deeply intolerant and often angry towards those who do not buy into the narrative that all is preference. And it doesn't matter uh, what you believe or how you live or how you define yourself as long as you are true to yourself. If you don't buy into that narrative, intolerant tolerance wants to eliminate you from the scene. Now, let me tell you three reasons why I think that is a major threat to the spread and growth of Christianity in this country. First, it threatens to exclude Christians from public life, from the public square. Now, it might be that that results in Christians not being allowed to say things at work or being excluded from certain places of employment. Or it might be that Christian groups may be excluded from things like this, renting buildings. Um, I have pastors who have tried uh, to rent different places, whether community centers or schools, and because of their commitment to biblical truth, and even though they say we are absolutely tolerant of everybody to hold whatever view they, they want to, but this is what we believe, they have been excluded from renting the premises because they don't buy in to that narrative. You see, it can be very deadly. It threatens to exclude us from public life. Second, because it puts pressure on Christians to stay silent about our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure there are people in this room who have felt that pressure, uh, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, whether it's amongst your friends or your family, whether it's in the area of sexuality, gender, or religious belief. The conversation goes, it might be in the coffee room, it might be just over a family dinner, and people are saying, yeah, so-and-so believes that, that's their preference in this area, and you just clam up. You know your belief is different, but the whole culture seems to suck your words out and you don't feel able to say them. We fear losing our jobs or being seen as old-fashioned, out of touch with modern life. And third, it threatens to alienate younger generations from the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this alternative philosophy, this commitment to preference above all things in all these areas is pumped, do you know this, is absolutely pumped into the younger generations through two particular places, education and entertainment. That's how you do it if you want to change a society. You don't get them to read books. Particularly, what you do is you pump in the new philosophy, the new agenda through what they hear as the standard and through the programs that they want, so that the new normal is created before their eyes. You see, I think that is a major threat uh, to the spread of Christianity in this country. But let me say this straight away. The purpose of my sermon is not to make you feel depressed. Uh, the dangers we face are real. And the dangers we face in this country are serious. However, in this section of the book of Acts, we are presented with a God who is more than able to ensure that his message keeps on spreading around the world, no matter what people try to do to stop it, okay? So you should not leave today depressed. There's a realism about what I'm saying, but we should leave encouraged, because in short, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. And what that means is that God is ultimately in control of all things, and he is committed to his gracious plan for global gospel communication. So no matter what the threats, the gospel will advance. Now, there are two sections I want to highlight this morning from Acts chapter 23. You see on your outline, first, the threat to God's message, uh, verses 11 to 15, and then second, the protection of God's message, verses 16 to 35. So first, let's look at the threat to God's message. Uh, look at verse 11. 11. At the following uh, night, the Lord, the Lord Jesus, stood near Paul and said, Take courage, as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. What an encouragement at this point to Paul. Um, he is undergoing all sorts of threats to his safety, all sorts of hardship. But the Lord Jesus Christ says, like, you're in Jerusalem now. You have testified about me. I know you have the desire to get to Rome, to the heart of the Roman Empire. Let me promise you something. You're going to get there. 
So that's what's said, and then he wakes up. And the next morning, what are we told? Verse 12, the next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders, that's the Jewish elders, and said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin petition the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. And we are ready to do what? To kill him before he gets here. Well, this is surely an ominous moment for the advance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It all happens straight after the Lord Jesus makes that wonderful promise to the apostle Paul that he will stand in Rome and testify about Christ. In verse 11, there is a tremendous mood of optimism But then in verses 12 to 13, you can see the dark clouds of gospel suffocation gather very quickly. Here is a direct threat to the life of the Apostle Paul. Notice it is to the Apostle Paul. Paul was not just an individual Christian. He's not just a disciple sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. He is an apostle. He is one of the chosen ambassadors of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. One of the apostles, that is, he is one of the key leaders in the early church. Someone whose task it is to preserve and promote the authentic message of Christ Jesus for his generation, and in particular to the Gentiles, but not just for his generation, but to make sure it is passed on authentically to the generations to come. So this is not just a threat to an individual. This is a threat to the apostle Paul. You see, at this point, that this is a serious threat uh, to God's message spreading around the world. In verse 12, we meet the group who want to assassinate God's messenger. And what are we told about them? Did you see? There are lots of them. There are 40 of them. 40 dedicated religious zealots who have one ambition, to rid the earth of Paul. They want to kill him. They want to murder him. And they are fully committed, aren't they, to their murderous endeavor. Do you see it? They pledge to go without food and drink. And you know you're serious when it affects your food and drink, don't you? They're not going to eat or drink until they kill him. And so bold and serious are they that they approach the chief priests and the Jewish elders for what purpose? Because they want to manipulate them into lying to the Roman commander to get Paul there on a pretext so that when he gets there, they'll kill him. You've got to be serious about your murderous endeavors to do that. So from a human perspective, do you see, it looks like game over for Paul. It looks like it's game over for Paul, and that means it's game over for the advance of God's message. It's going to be significantly slowed or even stopped all together. That's what we're being shown. And therefore, what is the answer? What can possibly save the Apostle Paul from that imminent death at the hands of these religious zealots? Well, perhaps a better question is who can save Paul? Who can save Paul from a quick departure from active gospel mission? And the short answer is God. And when I say God, what I mean, I'm talking about the sovereign God, who holds every single circumstance in the palm of his hands. Now, the God of the Bible is not a distant God who gazes at the earth and keeps on going, oh no, what are they doing? I have absolutely no control over anything. I seem so distant and my hands are tied. No, the God of the Bible is not in a constant state of panic and alarm as he gazes from a distance. No, the God of the Bible is in charge of every situation, and he is more than able to defend his precious message from any assaults against it. And that's what we see about to happen. In his wisdom, God chooses the perfect protection methods to suit the particular circumstances. So let me show you what he did for the Apostle Paul. There is an imminent threat to his life. Well, how does God protect his message. Well, listen to verse 16. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, 
he went into the barracks and told Paul. Wow, <laughs> I love this. What a marvelous example of God arranging the times and the people to ensure that his messengers and his message continue to advance in the way that he wants. You read verse 16 and you think, Paul's got a sister? Where did she come from? <laughs> Paul's got a nephew? Really? And they just happened to be living in Jerusalem? And Paul's nephew just so happens to be in a particular place at just the moment when some people are talking about this murderous but secret plot against his uncle? Fancy that. It's a marvelous example of God arranging the situations. It's what we call God's providence. There's a word you might want to scribble down. God's providence. Providence is the belief that God is behind every event and every situation, arranging all the details for the good of his people and the glory of his name. That's what God's providence is. Now, God's providence can either be bitter or sweet. Bitter providence is when God's arrangement of things brings us initial sadness. So it's not that God isn't in charge. He is in charge. But the arrangement brings us initial sadness. Yes, God is still working for our good. But at the time, it feels hard and bitter. Have you ever had that sort of providence? Sweet providence is when God's arrangement of things makes us feel happy. Now, what we have in these verses, I think, is a little bit of both. Initially, we have some bitter providence. It is amazing that Paul's nephew just happens to be in Jerusalem. It is amazing that he just happens to overhear the plot. And it is just amazing that he actually is allowed into the barracks to speak with Paul. You can't do that. Can you imagine doing that to, to a local military barracks, just going up to the soldiers on the, on the gate, says, hey, I, I've got a friend in there. I just want to go and have a chat. Can I do that? Oh, yes. Yes, come in. No, they'll be going, I think not. They'll point you, get off. But his nephew, oh, yeah, come in, chat to, chat to your uncle. It's amazing, but initially, the news that he brings to Paul is that there is a plot that seems from a human vantage point completely uh, impossible to prevent, and it is full of bitter threats against the messenger of God. But as we read on, the taste of providence becomes much sweeter. So listen to verse 17. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. And how does he respond? Well, so he took him to the commander. That's amazing. So Paul says to the centurion, look, can you take him to your commander, please? And he goes, yeah, all right. <laughs> you see, it's the unfolding story of God arranging the situations so that God's message will be protected. So what happens? Verse 19, the commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? He said, some Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They've taken this oath. They're not going to eat or drink until they killed him. They're ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. And the commander dismissed the young man with the warning, don't tell anyone you've reported this to me. Now, there's just some wonderful moments in this unfolding drama. And not only does the centurion take him to the commander, but the commander gives Paul's nephew an audience and actually listens to what he has to say. So maybe the tide is turning. Maybe this religious zealot mob of 40 are not going to have their day. Well, you read the next verse and you discover that is certainly going to be the case. Verse 23, then the commander called two of his centurions and ordered them. Now get, get this list. Get ready a detachment of how many soldiers? 200. How many horsemen? 70. How many? Oh, get some spearmen as well. 200 of them. And then Paul, make sure that he isn't walking along. Give him a horse. So we started off, didn't we, the 40 religious zealots against this one defenseless individual. But now the tie seems to have turned. We've got 200 soldiers. We've got spearmen. We've got horsemen. We've got Paul on a horse as well. And verse 25, he wrote a letter to Governor Felix, which clearly presents Paul in very good terms. 
And the result of all this is just at activity is summarized in verse 31. So the soldiers carrying out their orders took Paul with them during the night and brought him as far as Ant Ant Antipatris. The next day they let the cavalry go with them when they returned to the barracks. And when the cavalry arrived in Caesarea, they delivered the letter to the governor and handed Paul over to him. The governor read the letter, asked what province, and then he says, I will hear your case. Look, all of this is supposed to encourage us big time. Big time. Uh, initially, there is a violent threat against Paul that seems impossible to stop. And as a consequence, the advance of the gospel of Christ seems to be nearing its end. And yet, God has other plans. God's plan is that his message will advance even when it is threatened by overwhelming human resources. And in this case, he uses a young man and you don't even know his name and you never heard about him. But this one man has been put in a place for just a time as this. God uses all these circumstances to keep the gospel open. Isn't God great? He is like an expert conductor arranging all the instruments together so the perfect tune is heard. God's providence will ensure that God's message will advance to exactly where it needs to go despite the threats that push against it. So let's apply that to the threat we started with, this intolerant tolerance. Let us be encouraged when we consider the national threats to our country. We don't know how the gospel will continue to advance in the UK. And we should certainly wise up about how we spread God's message, about how we do it in winsome ways. But let us not give in to fear. God's message cannot be thwarted when God wants it to be advanced. I don't know what that'll mean for the church in the UK in the decades to come. Does it mean that we become like the church in China and that we go underground and we're not allowed to use buildings in public spaces or not? We don't know. But God does. And God will ensure that his gospel will advance against the threat. It may be something different. It might be that our secular world wakes up to the madness of its philosophy and abandons it. We don't know. But the big message... Our hearts cannot be ruled by fear. Let us be encouraged as we consider the future of this local church. Uh, will there always be a place for us to meet? Well, we don't know the exact plans that God has for us. But if you've been around in the last five and a half years, we have seen God provide again and again and again. And it makes my hair go gray. And it's not something I wake up in the morning going, hey, bring on another one. But we have seen God provide because he's kind. Does it mean that we will always be allowed to meet in public spaces? Will it be that we have to buy our own building? Where will that be? I don't know all the answers, but I can tell you this, that God's providence will ensure that we have everything we need to play our part in gospel mission. And therefore, we will not be ruled by fear. Uh, let's consider the fears that our children, young people, will never be able to comprehend and communicate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because they swim in this toxic sea of intolerant tolerance, which just seems to say, you cannot believe the gospel, can you, if you swim in the sea? My friends, do not be afraid for your kids. Do not be afraid for your grandchildren. Yes, they are swimming against the tide, and not just against the tide, but they are swimming in a horrible place. But the same gospel that converted you is the power of God to save them. Amen. God will ensure that his unchanging gospel will continue to advance through the future generations. Finally, let's be encouraged by our place in God's plans. God has you where you are for a reason. He really does. Whether we have the status of Paul's nephew or Paul's commander. It doesn't matter. God can use anyone to advance the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wherever you are as a Christian, uh, whether you are in a workplace, whether you are retired, whether you are younger, whether you're at home, it doesn't matter. What does the Lord say to you? Be a faithful disciple. Wherever he has put you in his providence right now, be a faithful disciple and trust that your Father in heaven has a role for you in his glorious mission. 
Now, he will not tell you all the time what that is. And that's sometimes why we get so frustrated, don't we? We pause our life thinking, I cannot do anything until God tells me why I'm here. Oh, brothers and sisters, forget it. Be a person of faith. And to know that God in his providence has you there for a reason. And he says, trust me, be a faithful disciple. And maybe when you arrive in heaven, I will show you the board. But that's encouraging, isn't it? We don't need to know everything until we are useful for God. We just need to be faithful in the circumstances of our lives and trust that God is always at work behind the scenes according to his perfect providence. Let's pray. So just a moment for you to respond to God. It might be that you are here and you don't yet have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and maybe you long to believe in a God who is in charge of all things like this. That is the God of the Bible. Maybe you fear the situations and circumstances of life at the moment. Maybe you're becoming depressed and anxious because you don't seem to be in control. Well, God says you're not in control, but I am. Maybe this is a moment to trust him. There are brothers and sisters here who need to exercise their faith muscles and to know that God has them in the right place for his reason. Father, we thank you so much for your providence. And whether right now in our lives we are receiving bitter providence or sweet providence, uh, we pray that we would know that you are good and that you are prospering us to be more like Jesus.